this is the Limerick Lifelong Learning Festival 2014. Um, and our slogan this year is your learning, your culture. Obviously to reflect that it's the Limerick City of Culture 2014. Um, I've been participating in the Limerick or in the Lifelong Learning Festival since it started. Um, I started my first lecture, attracted six people. <laughs> um, most of them were over 70. <laughs> my second lecture, I've been ramping up. Last, last year I got 20. And, and that's, you know, the, the estimate for the press. But look, isn't this great? So, my title is 1914, 2014. From Flanders Fields to the Higgs Field. Now, so let's start. The European Union's Large Hadron Collider based at the CERN Particle Physics Laboratory near Geneva in Switzerland, sorry, is near Geneva in Switzerland. Its 27 kilometer circular accelerator located 100 meters below the ground is the world's largest and most expensive laboratory, which is dedicated to the pursuit of fundamental science. On the 4th of July, 2012, CERN announced and subsequently confirmed that they had detected a Higgs boson, a particle that physicists had been looking for since it was predicted by Peter Higgs, he's down in the corner, slightly younger than when he predicted it, but not much. Not much, I think this was five years before he predicted the Higgs boson. This discovery of the Higgs boson is heralded as one of the greatest discoveries of our time. It was certainly the most expensive. But let's see, what do, what do we mean by the greatest discovery of our time? But first of all, we need to go back a bit. So one of the perceived difficulties in grasping with the ideas of modern physics is that there is no common sense or what they call classical physics pictures to help visualize them. Here I claim that this assertion is not true, that if we search in other domains, particularly in the symbolic human domain, we can encounter an everyday picture that helps our understanding. So the title of my talk forms a short circuit between history and science and prompts the question, can a scientist, speaking as a scientist, and not as an inadequately informed amateur, legitimately make comment on other domains than science without being a crank or a dilettante? Can a scientist make meaningful, con meaningful contributions to fields such as history, economics, politics, aesthetics, even, heaven forbid, theology, when he speaks under the condition of science. In 1939, Albert Einstein wrote a letter to President F.D. Roosevelt saying roughly that nuclear energy is here. War is inevitable. It is, up, it is for you to decide what scientists should do about it. So even the pacifist Einstein did not feel he could intrude into the political domain with as much as a suggestion. He clearly felt that politics was for politicians and science was for scientists. One of the founders of modern mathematics, George Cantor, discovered a sequence of different types of infinity. The concept of these new infinities was quite distinct from the previous concept of a unique infinity that in some terms of thought was fused with the concept of God. Being a good Christian, Cantor was disturbed by his discovery. Yet, 
being a good mathematician, he did not attempt to hide his new discovery. Instead, Cantor wrote a letter to the Pope. This is what he said. My mathematical creation has led to a new quantitative infinity. The real qualitative infinity is only God. So Cantor gave the Pope a way out. And indeed, the Catholic Church's reply was, God is beyond numbers. So these two great thinkers of the 19th and 20th century were victims of the horrific academic destiny of specialization, where different domains of knowledge are kept partitioned in hermetic isolation, protected by taboos of which the most primitive religions and their witch doctors would be proud. The Killing Fields. No lecture addressing the dire world situation of 2014 can avoid mentioning the dire world situation of 1914, which saw the commencement of the greatest human extermination by humans up to that point in what was known as the Great War. The poppy seed has a tendency to lie dormant in undisturbed ground for years and to germinate only when the ground is disturbed. During the trench warfare of the Great War, the ground was well and truly disturbed with picks and shovels and bombs, and the poppy thrived. In Flanders Fields, The Poppies Blow, was a poem written early in the war by a Canadian Lieutenant Colonel, John McRae, who still had a romantic view of the war, and indeed, the poem was the inspiration behind the use of the poppy ever since in memory of the war dead throughout the then British Empire. Later on in the war, in the killing fields of Flanders, a different flowering took place, that of poetry. Not very romantic poetry, exposing the brutality and stupidity of war. Wilfred Owen, Siegfried Sassoon, Francis Ledwich, of whom on his death in 1917, his patron and commander, Lord Dunsany, wrote, destinies shook and the earth shook, and as the war, not yet described by any man, reveled and wallowed in destruction around him, Francis Ledwich stayed true to his inspiration. So this poetic eruption declared, You can kill this human individual, but you will not kill the human spirit, the spirit that remains immortalized in these lines. Led by Jeremy Taxman, this year sees the stampede to normalize the Great War as viewed through the eyes of the time. But this approach is wrong, because as seen through the eyes of the time, Siegfried Sassoon was treasonous. However, time's magnifying glass shows that Sassoon was correct. It is now a commonplace that the First World War was futile and stupid. Even Blackadder, not to mention such movies as Gallipoli, acknowledged that the Great War was a machine for the extermination of superfluous youth. Since the Napoleonic Wars, soldiers were never meant to return. Those that did became only a nuisance and a guilty reminder. While many young men of 20 said goodbye to take the king's shilling, almost to a man, the few that returned were ostracized and shunned when they came back alive. So, the flat fields of Flanders when all the guns and soldiers had either been buried or cleared off, was pockmarked with holes and trenches, mounds and embankments. In Flanders, a field was a field, in which for each hole there was an adjacent mound, and for each trench there was a parallel embankment. As time passed, the mounds and embankments gradually eroded back into the holes, 
and today the flat landscape is restored to its original aspect. Here and there, the landscape is pockmarked with battalions of gravestones standing to attention and their accompanying monuments to facilitate the politicians in their yearly pilgrimages and their crocodile tears, lest we remember. No Passaran. Less than 20 years after the armistice of the Great War, the war to end all wars, the battle lines between culture and bestiality, between civilization and barbarism, were again being drawn up. This time, artists, writers, poets, musicians from all over Europe and further afield converged outside Madrid to form a thin line of resistance against Franco and his forces, who, returning to Spain after a spree of rape, pillage and terror in Morocco, was out to overthrow the elected government of the Republic. As if in resonance with the indomitable spirit of the dead poets of the Great War, these men and women lined up against Franco's army. Their resistance cry of no passeran, you shall not pass, still inspires those who resist barbarism today. From the English-speaking world, Orwell, Hemingway, Laurie Lee were joined in turn by their counterparts from other cultures. Picasso portrayed in painting the extermination in total war of the Basque town of Guernica immediately after the event. This portrayal still has such resonance that in 2003, when the US Secretary of State, Colin Powell, presented the case for war against Iraq in pursuit of Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction, the UN workers, under pressure from the US administration, had to cover the tapestry reproduction of Picasso's painting draped behind the podium. Artists are ever at the forefront of defending culture. Gabriel Byrne's intervention last year probably curtailed the crassest excesses of the commercial exploitation of the gathering. Hopefully, the resignation of Carl Wallace, the artistic direct director of the Limerick City of Culture, might redirect energy from short-term commercial profit to investment that will provide longer-term returns for Limerick. But where were all the scientists? Were they too busy perfecting the bombs and bullets? Perfecting the trajectories so that the missiles would accurately hit their target? That they gave no thought to the targets themselves? Do not scientists also represent the human spirit? Were they leaving politics to the politicians, economics to the economists, and our value system to the theologians and the religious? Science conditions philosophy. Immanuel Kant was the great philosopher of specialization, of Newtonian mechanism, where the world is perceived as a universal machine made up of independently existing parts interacting blindly upon each other. Science, being a part of the world, had its own theory of knowledge, but it was not one that could unite all domains of knowledge. For Kant, synthesizing a coherent picture of the world requires that man, unite, that man unite and connect the isolated fragments of scientific knowledge together with other forms of knowledge, some of which are accepted solely according to whims, sympathies, opinions, morality, etc. So a synthesis from such disparate sources required for Kant some out of this world transcendent guarantor. Kantian thinking is rampant today. The economic, ecologic, and humanitarian crises are compartmentalized into separate domains. Obesity in the West is seen to have no relation to the starvation in Africa. Unrest and war 
are seen to have no relation with the arms industry, which, after all, is only chasing a good business opportunity. The depletion of the Earth's natural resources is seen to have no relation to the mountains of obsolescent waste generated daily. And the teenage suicide epidemic is seen to have no relation to the subtle change in their young lives from being a blessing to their parents at birth to incurring a debt of gratitude to those same parents for their simple existence. We parents are lucky when our teenage children only engage in sullen rebellion against this state of affairs. In our economy, the guarantor of all decisions and policies is the market with its invisible hand. From the point of view of the market, in spite of what it says on the almighty dollar, God has long been dead as has any value system that prioritizes other than market values. The market, on the other hand, is alive and kicking. It must forever be satisfied, humored, and its moods, as measured by the appropriately named Moody's, must constantly be reported on and commented on in the press. In my view, the discovery of the Higgs boson heralds the end of the Kantian separation of the theory of scientific knowledge from the theory of knowledge in other domains. I hope to demonstrate that the meaning of the scientific concept of field is invariant across different domains of knowledge and its meaning can lead us to a less fragmentary understanding of the current economic ecologic and humanitarian catastrophes ac across the globe. The Higgs field has the ability to confer rest mass onto the Higgs boson and onto the other elementary particles such as electrons which manifest with mass. The process bears an uncanny resemblance to humanity's ability to confer value. Value itself is a human construct. For instance, a spoon has no intrinsic value outside of its use in human culture to eat soup. It, has of, it is of little use to a polar bear. The values of all commodities, the values of natural resources, and even our value system itself arise from the system of culture established by humanity's existence and social practice in its historical entirety. Commodities get an additional explicit contribution to their value from the individual labor expended in their manufacture, and indeed they would not exist as such. Value therefore resembles Hegel's spiritual substance, something that cannot be reduced to an individual's experience and activity, but nonetheless is kept alive only by individuals' incessant activity. My contention here is that the resemblance between the concept of rest mass in the quantum domain and the concept of use value in the symbolic human domain a resemblance that reaffirms the appropriateness of the nickname the God Particle, a nickname that this Leon Lederman, a Nobel Prize winner in physics, put on the Higgs boson. That this resemblance il illuminates a possible cut through the complexities of the market and it suggests a manner of intervention that will not unravel the fabric of our society and will not lead to calamity and apocalypse. Hegel's description of the individual psyche as a particle of the spirit is intriguing in itself for our purposes here. But Hegel was also to develop a theory of the quantum in the philosophical domain 100 years before Max Planck had his breakthrough in the domain of physics. So it's time 
to learn some physics. So we're going on to quantum field theory. All of the complex structures that we see in the world are held together by four fundamental forces. The gravitational force, the electromagnetic force, the, the so-called weak force, and the strong force. In each case, the fundamental objects carrying the force and the objects feeling the force are zero-dimensional point particles. Unbelievable. These are the Euclidean points that we learned in school. The point that doesn't exist, but it exists. That's what our fundamental particles. As yet, the gravitational force has resisted being incorporated into a consistent theory with the other three, which have been unified in what's called the standard model. There's the standard model in all its complexity. This model has now become, been confirmed by the experiments at CERN. Current speculative thinking is that it may require a one-dimensional object, not a point particle, such as a string, for gravity to be successfully incorporated into the theory. But who knows? Of the four forces, there are the four along the middle there, gravitational, weak, electromagnetic, and strong. Um, <coughs> the gravitational force and the electromagnetic forces are the most familiar. They are long-range forces, so many of their consequences are detectable at our human scale. On the largest scale, gravity dominates through the formations of planets, galaxies, clusters, etc. Electromagnetism produces interesting structures such as tables, chairs, cats, and ourselves through solid state and chemical forces. The strong force and the weak force have no classical analogues. They are short range forces that have no obvious effect at our human scale. Each force has an associated charge, the electrical charge being the most familiar. The charge associated with gravity is mass, or equivalently energy, as Einstein told us. Unlike the photon, which is a massless bundle of energy traveling at the speed of light, all other fundamental particles have mass, with the result that the gravity force couples to everything. The charge associated with the weak force goes by the name of flavor, of which there are six. Vanilla, strawberry, chocolate. No, uh, up, down, strange, charm, bottom, and top. They might as well have called vanilla, strawberry, chocolate. While the charge associated with the strong force is color, whatever that means. Each type of force, four forces, has its own field which in turn has its own particles, which can be further classified into two groups depending on their intrinsic angular momentum called spin. Particles with integer spin are called bosons, and those with half integer spin are called fermions. They're up on our table, bosons, fermions. Fermions, and an electron is a fermion, seem to have the tendency to pair up to form composite particles with integer spin, thereby forming bosons. Atoms and molecules with filled electron shells are bosons. So most of chemistry is governed by this tendency to, of electrons to pair up. Clusters of bosons tend to be very shy and to become invisible. Molecular solids and liquids with their filled shells, such as water, the glass that the water is held in, some concoction of soda and lime, soda lime glass, um, are invisible. Look at them. 
You can't see them. <laughs> Quartz, silicon dioxide, the, the glass of fiber optics, invisible to light. Uh, sugar, salt, diamond, your skin, transparent, in, in, invisible to light. They're not there. And it's clear to anyone who has walked into a glass door that just because you can't see it doesn't mean there's nothing there. The superconducting state where the supporting medium becomes absolutely transparent to electric current is the result of the clustering of electron pairs called Cooper pairs into the mother of all boson clusters the Bose-Einstein condensate. It turns out that the most invisible state of all, the vacuum, is such a Bose-Einstein condensate. So generally, each type of field has its own vacuum state, which is the ground state or the minimum energy state of that field. The gravitational field, with its charge of mass, has the Higgs field as its vacuum state. In order to account for the masses of the elementary particles of the three other fields of the standard model, the Higgs field has to be added in by hand, because gravity is not part of the standard model. So this field is plopped plopped in like that into the model. So this is one of the reasons why the conformation of the Higgs boson and by implication the Higgs field is very exciting for physicists as it may now suggest a clearer way towards a grand unification and indeed the detection of gravity waves in recent weeks has probably emerged from this new clarity. Physicists can now see what they're seeing. The empty space of our popular imagination, what we shall refer to henceforth as the bare vacuum, is not an adequate image once relativity theory, with its famous equivalence of mass and energy, E equals mc squared, is incorporated into quantum mechanics to form quantum field theory, in which what we shall refer to as the physical vacuum is conceived of, as consisting of particles and antiparticle pairs endlessly and spontaneously being created and annihilated. In classical physics, the concept of field is retroactively constructed from the forces between the particles. However, the modern concept of field is now understood to be the material background from which the particles and antiparticle pairs themselves are constructed. In quantum field theory, the physical vacuum is the ultimate field. If a particle is created from the physical vacuum, then, since it cannot be created from nothing, a corresponding antiparticle must also be created. A field is a field. If we create something positive, we have to create something negative. They go together. If something appeared in the field and there was no apparent anti, particle, we'd know that the level of the field had lowered. They'd swept it up from all over the field to make the mound in the middle. Or if a hole had appeared in the field, they'd have had to spread what was dug out of the hole all over the field. That's what we have to assume. In the particular physical vacuum associated with the electromagnetic field, the particle, the positive bit, the bit sticking up, is the electron and the bit down is the positron, also known, surprisingly, as a hole. So, in analogy with the fields of Flanders, 
the physical vacuum can be thought of as a vast sandy beach and all else, the stars, the earth, the trees, ourselves, the particles from which we are made can all be thought of as dunes in the sand, ripples which physicists call excitations or fluctuations of the physical vacuum. The Higgs field, let's get to the nub of this. In 1993, just after Thatcher had, had left office, I presume, David J. Miller, a physicist at University College London, proposed the following quasi-political explanation of the Higgs boson. And this is a famous, this is a very famous uh, explanation for the then UK Minister for Energy, Mr. Waldegrave. And he proposed for the Higgs mechanism Imagine a cocktail party of political party workers who are evenly distributed around the room, all talking to their nearest neighbours. The ex-Prime Minister, Maggie Thatcher, enters and crosses the room. So all the workers in her vicinity are strongly attracted to her and cluster around her. As she moves, she attracts the people she comes close to while the ones she has left return to their even spacing. Because of the knot of people always clustered around her, she acquires a greater mass than normal. That is, she has more momentum for the same speed of movement across the room. Once moving, she is harder to stop. And once stopped, she is harder to get moving again because the clustering process has to be restarted. In three dimensions and with the complications of relativity, this is the Higgs mechanism. In order to give particles mass, a background field is postulated, which becomes locally distorted whenever a particle moves through it. The distortion, the clustering of fields around the particle, generates the particle's mass. And now let's go to the Higgs boson. So Maggie Thatcher is like an electron. It's not a, Higgs, not a Higgs particle, it's a particle from somewhere else, but it gets its mass in this way as it passes through the Higgs field. Now, the Higgs boson itself. Now, consider a rumour passing through a room full of uniformly spaced political workers. Those next to the door hear of it first and cluster together to get the details. Then they turn and move closer to their next neighbours who want to know about it too. A wave of clustering passes through the room. It may spread out to all the corners, or like here, it may form a compact bunch which carries the news along a line of workers from the door to some dignitary at the other side of the room. Since the information is carried by clusters of people, and since it was clustering which gave extra mass to Maggie Thatcher, then the rumour carrying clusters also have mass. The Higgs boson is just such a clustering of the Higgs field. The understanding is that in the early universe, as the hot gas of particles created in the Big Bang expanded and cooled, just as water condenses on a cold window pane, a condense, as if from nothing, a condensate of Higgs particles emerged, all held together by their mutual interactions in a suspension through which all other particles propagate. So the Higgs field is a Bose-Einstein condensate existing as an invisible energy field everywhere in the universe. The Mexican wave type clustering of the field gives rise to its fundamental particle, the Higgs boson. This is what is meant by the wave-particle duality of quantum physics, where the wave is the particle. Nothing mystical about it at all. The field also continuously interacts with other particles, such as electrons, which become slower as they pass through the field, a phenomenon interpreted as the inertial property called mass. If the Higgs field did not exist, particles would not have the mass 
required to gravitationally attract one another and would simply float around freely at the speed of light. Mass is not generated by the Higgs field as if created from nothing. It is, however, transferred to particles from the energy of the overall field. So now, from a quasi-political explanation of the Higgs field, we'll move to a very political explanation of the Higgs field. So, not only is the bare vacuum, the empty space of our popular imagination, an inadequate image for the ground state of a field, in the language of phase transitions, it transpires that the bare vacuum even requires more energy than the physical vacuum. The Higgs-filled vacuum is more energetically favorable than the Higgs-free vacuum. The physical vacuum is cheaper than the bare vacuum. Something is cheaper than nothing. So let's look at the two vacuums. So our approach will be to examine the two vacuums, the bare vacuum and the physical vacuum <coughs> in the quantum and the symbolic human domain. <coughs> in particular, we will examine particle creation in the electromagnetic field as it occurs in the bare vacuum and the physical vacuum. The electromagnetic field being one of the fields of the standard model. So it's a representative of the standard model. We shall then examine the two types of double entry money creation in the modern economy. Money creation in the bare vacuum, so-called ex nihilo or nominal money, and money creation in the physical vacuum, so-called ex materia or real money. Money, being the mother of all symbols of value, represents for us here the symbolic human domain. So we'll go and look at electromagnetic pair production. The Dirac equation for the electron, here it is on Dirac's plaque in, I don't know where it is, Westminster Abbey or someplace. Um, I something D by D, B D of this yoke equals M times the yoke. It's self-referential. It refers back to itself. The simplest first-order differential equation uh, that school children meet in secondary school when they're studying calculus for the first time. They meet this kind of equation. It's the simplest equation you can imagine, yet it is the equation at the pinnacle of quantum field theory. Unbelievable. When we apply this equation to the bare vacuum, it allows for electron to exist in an infinite number of discrete energy levels. These, th this is what the lines on, on this page, we're, we're looking at energy going up, energy going down, and the, the lines are discrete lines, they're discrete energy levels. And it allows for electrons to exist in an infinite number of discrete energy levels. These energy levels extend all the way up in the positive energy direction to infinity. They also extend all the way down to minus infinity. We leave aside for the moment what a negative energy means. We'll come back to that, if you don't mind. According to the Dirac equation, if at a certain time we start in the bare vacuum, this is in the nothing of our imagination, a fluctuation will generate a positive and negative electron Equal positive, equal negative, add them up, we still have zero. We haven't, it's all out of nothing here.
so we can generate two electrons, one with positive energy, one with negative energy, e sorry, equal, but positive and negative energy. Total energy is still zero. However, once the electrons are created, the system finds it can lower its energy by letting either or both of the two electrons fall to a lower energy level. And when electrons fall from a high energy level to a low energy level, they emit energy. That's what our light bulb is doing all the time. We've excited the, the wire with um, an electric field. The electrons are excited, and as they jump down, they emit light. That's the emission of energy. So when electrons jump, we get energy. So the, the positive energy electron can jump to a negative energy state. Oh, there's energy. The negative energy electron can also jump. It can jump down. And we get energy out of it. In fact, both electrons can keep jumping down because we go down to minus infinity. So we have an infinite supply of energy, two infinite supplies of energy. Sorted. Ring ender. We've sorted the problem. So we can do this ad infinitum. So this, when the electron falls and emits energy, that's called annihilation. That's the scientific term for it. Annihilation. We'll come back to that. So we have falling down, and there's no bottom, just keeps going. Perpetual annihilation. So we can interpret that as the realization of the ultimate fantasy of infinite energy, or alternatively, since all electrons have a tendency to fall down, it's a catastrophic instability. The world, as we know it, couldn't exist if that happened. But yet, this is, the Dirac, this is what the Dirac equation tells us. And we know the Dirac equation is right, with the certainty of scientists. Yeah, right. So, both of these options, a perpetual supply of energy, the catastrophic instability, are not, are impossible in the world of physical reality. The first, because there is not an infinite supply of energy in the physical universe. And the second, because in the physical world, electrons do actually exist and persist in states of positive energy. That's what we're made out of. So, in order to deal with these physical impossibilities, Dirac made the astounding postulate that all the red ones, all the negative energy states, were already full. They're full of electrons. This is a circumstance that is known as the Dirac C. With a full C, there is no space for a negative energy electron to fall to. So we're back to stability. And of course, with a full C, we're back to, we, we can't have an unending supply of energy. So the Dirac C is the physical vacuum, the material foundation of this particular field, the electromagnetic field. The surface of the Dirac C is a little bit lower than zero because in order to get to zero, or sorry, in order to get down, the thing filling the negative is an electron which has mass. If the electron raised itself up to zero, it wouldn't be an electron. Because zero means no mass. Zero energy, according to Einstein, energy is equal to mc squared. 
So this gap here, we call it the rest energy of the electron. So the energy gap is equal to the, what we call the rest mass of the, this is an electron just barely created. It has no other energy to it, but it has its mass. So the negative energy surface is like a surface tension, which we can identify with the presence of the Higgs field. The Higgs field, as I said, has to be thrown in, superimposed on the electromagnetic case. And this low energy state makes the physical vacuum more energetically favorable than the bare vacuum. It requires lower energy to be at the surface of that sea than it does to be at zero energy. But it is only when we have established this physical vacuum, this full Dirac C, that particle and antiparticle pair creation can occur. This is, the, this is the, the sand we saw earlier. It's only when we have the sand pit full, we can start digging our holes. So the positron, right, if I somehow excite an electron from the negative energy state up into the positive energy state, this is this orange arrow here, I can only do that by inputting energy. I have to put the amount of energy equal to the length of that yellow arrow. And then I can lift an electron from here and put it up into a positive energy state. And what is left? A hole. That's what we call it. The hole is, uh, is sorry, the, the te more technical name is the positron, the antiparticle of the electron. So the positron is like a photographic negative of the electron. It is the absence of a negatively charged electron with negative energy from the background of the full Dirac C. And it is conferred with mass through its interaction with the intervening Higgs field. So you can see the gap. The gap is the positron. It is moving backwards while the electron is moving forward. And if you look at it slightly blurry, you're kind of wondering which is moving. Is it the gap that's moving or is it the electron that's moving? But the gap, that's a positron. And the background, we have a black background here, that our, our signif signifies our Higgs filled vacuum, the physical vacuum. Okay, let's go back to the bare vacuum case. In the bare vacuum case, the negative energy states are interpreted as states in which their particles travel backwards in time. This is our negative energy state. An electron with its negative, en sorry, with its negative charge occupying a negative energy state looks and behaves like a positron. It kind of looks very similar to the previous picture, except we now have particles for black. It's not the background. The background is grayer. That's a Higgs-free background. We have two different particles here. We had a particle and the background in the previous case. This is the bare vacuum case. Now, but this negative energy electron, this black fellow, cannot be interpreted as a positron because there is no background against which it reveals itself. There is no Higgs field to give each of those particles their energy, their mass. The energy, so this is the bare vacuum. We still have the gap. We have the electron jumping up to a positive energy state, but yet we're in the bare vacuum. We have no Higgs field. There is no source of mass here. So the electron must get its mass from somewhere. <clears throat> 
Val 1, the upper one, the electron gets its mass by borrowing energy from the future. And for the lower one, the negative energy electron gets its mass by borrowing its energy from the past. Living on borrowed time is a feature of the bare vacuum. Now, let's look at money. This time we're going to go in reverse. We're going to start with physical reality, and then we'll go into the reality that we're living in at the moment. So, physical reality. Let's consider the payment of a wages bill for which the firm requests a line of credit from the bank. The bank creates a double entry by entering two equal numbers one on the debit side and one on the credit side of its balance sheet. At the instant the wages are paid, one of the numbers gets distributed into the workers' accounts. That's the blue one. Their their, that's their deposit in the bank. The other number is a debt of the firm. That's the negative energy state. The firm, of course, in the meantime, takes possession of the output that has been produced in the past week. Um, and this has an exchange value. So the wage, the firm's debt, the economic output are all different faces of the same identical object. In due course, the wages are spent at the same rate as the physical output is consumed and at the same rate as the firm's debt is repaid. For instance, at the end of the week, the larder is empty, the purse is empty, and the, the firm's debt to the bank has been repaid. We're all square at the end of the week. And hope, hope we go, the wage comes in on Friday night. Send out to Donkey Fords for chips. <laughs> When new money is created on the basis of new economic output in the economy, it is referred to as real money. Our wages are real money. This real money gets its value, A, from the social human need satisfied by the new physical output, and from the individual labor embodied in it. The issue of a mortgage is subtly different. When a bank agrees to issue a mortgage, it also creates a double entry by entering two equal numbers into its account book, one on the debit side and one on the credit side. Once the house changes possession, one of the numbers gets transferred to the credit side of the seller's account and the other number gets transferred to the debit side of the mortgagee's account as an interest-bearing debt. However, once the house purchase is complete, the two numbers in the buyer's and seller's accounts cease to have any organic economic connection to the house itself. Or to each other, in that matter. The, all the house has done is set the numerical value of the entries in the bank. In this way, the new money appears as a creation from nothing, and such money is referred to as ex nihilo or nominal money. The number entered into the seller's credit account is new money, which is added to the existing money supply. And since in the house, in the normal house, no new physical output has been produced. The house was there yesterday. The house was there last year. The house was probably there 100 years ago. It's not a new product in the economy. So the, the, the number in the seller's account is no money created from nothing, sorry, from nothing new. And it is spread over the same economy as yesterday. 
So the prices of existing stock must increase. So inflation of the money supply, a sort of borrowing from the past, a hand in everybody's pocket, is the first burden that the wider society must bear as a consequence of this manner of creating money. As the interest-bearing debt is replayed, sorry, of the mortgagee is repaid in installments over the terms of the loan, the additional money in the economy is gradually withdrawn and the original integrity of the money supply is restored at the final payment of the capital. Any money that is used to pay interest on this mortgage must therefore come from somewhere else in the economy. So the payment of interest is a sort of borrowing from the future, is therefore the second burden on the rest of the economy that arises from this manner of creating money. Both sides of the ex nihilo double entry of the mortgage transaction cause real activity in the economy. So there is an illusion that both sides are real money or assets. This illusion gives rise to the stock and bond markets, where these assets are reissued by the banks as more additional money into the economy. And as there is no stopping point to this reissue, this process can continue ad infinitum. This is the shadow banking system. The real banking system does it up to a point. The shadow banking system is taking it to infinity. So this is what occurs in modern banking, where perpetual monetary self-expansion reaches its peak in the speculations on self-referencing derivatives and futures options, which trade on the self-referencing fears and anxieties caused by the volatility and risks associated with ex nihilo money itself. This vicious circle leads to a world where insurance is the fastest growing industry, in inverted commas. The meltdown of the global economy shows that the economic system, based on the creation of money from nothing, has no basis in physical or economic reality. Yet, the recycling of this new money into the economy does trigger real economic activity whose material base must therefore be located in depletion somewhere else. Perpetual motion machines. You always have to do a double take. You can't, oh, why, doesn't, why doesn't that magnet pull the car? And there are patents coming in, patent applications come in every year for perpetual motion machines. They, they're non, they don't stop. Because you have to, ah, they're very attractive. Wouldn't it be gorgeous? <laughs> and they look plausible. My God. But no, we, we have to look at depletion somewhere else. So, sorry, love. In failing to acknowledge that the value of the money in our economy arises from social humanity itself, the economic activity stimulated by money created from nothing becomes grossly distorted. When commodities are produced for their exchange value alone, the bias in production is to make products that add nothing to society's culture and heritage, but generally subtracts from and depletes it. Products for which the presence of a logo more than doubles their price, for which nothing definitely costs more than something. As Aldous Huxley put it over 50 years ago, armaments, universal debt, and planned obsolescence those are the three pillars of Western prosperity. And indeed, the beginning of the 21st century sees the USA, the most powerful economy in the world, configured as a war economy. It sees the economies of Europe dismantling their welfare states in order to save the banks, to repay debts 
that can never be repaid because the structural foundations of, ex nihilo, of the ex nihilo money economy is a bottomless hole. It goes down to infinity, minus infinity. Already, the past century has witnessed a litany of human annihilations in disastrous and universal wars, barbarous exterminations and ethnic cleansings, work camps, gulags. The double burden caused by ex nihilo money drives companies into unrestrained production on an ever accelerating treadmill of raising profit while st simultaneously polluting the environment and exhausting natural resources, meanwhile destroying the conditions for sustainable human, animal and plant life. The double burden caused by ex nihilo money exacerbates third world starvation and humanitarian crises by extracting interest on debt coupled with the laying waste of local economies. And even our children know this. They know, they're learning this in school. The double burden of ex nihilo money subordinates everything to market forces and leads to the debasement of arts, letters and education. But worst of all, the double burden on human society, coupled with the arithmetically impossible demand of balancing the bank's books, is unleashing a savage, destructive nihilism on humanity and human civilization, in deed and in thought. So let's look at our beacon of hope. When the engineer scientist Paul Dirac declared that the bottomless sea of negative energy states is already full and was therefore the new basis of physical reality, this was the nature of an axiom a self-evident truth. It could not be proven from the vantage point of the bare vacuum, where, in fact, the bottomless hole could never be filled. The Dirac postulate could only be enunciated from the vantage point of physical reality itself. When confronted with the contradictions of perpetual motion, and catastrophic instability associated with the creation of electrons from nothing, modern physics had to decide that the Dirac postulate was true and to proceed in fidelity to this decision. The experiments in CERN have now confirmed the existence of the Higgs boson and the Higgs field, which in turn confirms the existence of the electromagnetic physical vac vacuum. It is no longer a postulate. It's proven. So when confronted with the impossibility of perpetual monetary self-expansion and with the economic, ecologic and humanitarian catastrophes caused by the assumption that money can be created from nothing, modern humanity must now assert that the proper material basis for economic and monetary value is its own existence and social practice. From the understanding that ex nihilo money is a debt to society at large, it is a small step to see how the current economic crisis can be resolved without fear of unraveling the whole economic system by simply restituting the market value created by human society to human society and restituting the market value created by the private individual to the private individual. Finally making sense of Jesus's enigmatic statement, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. That our existence as human beings provides value, that these human values may not be reduced to market values, goes without saying. And indeed, these values have traditionally been dealt with by religions and moral codes, etc. However, 
It turns out that human society's contribution to market values can be exactly quantified in concrete market terms, and it can therefore be restored to human society in exact measure. This is hardly rocket science, <clears throat> let alone nuclear physics. But yet, it has taken the CERN experiment and its analogy to the human symbolic domain to fully reveal it. Dare we assert, as scientists, that this new experiment in science is a reminder of the 2,000-year-old Christian message of the rejection of the false gods of the market and money in the name of human flesh and blood. When God died on the cross, he handed over to the Holy Spirit. He placed his trust in us, the invisible multitude, the scum of the earth, to take charge of our own affairs. The flash of light confirming the Higgs boson is like the star in the east, signaling a new beginning for the, holy, for, for the human spirit, the Higgs field of human existence. When humanity finally trusts in itself and dispenses with the invisible hand of the market. Humanity must declare that the unfathomable debts to the banks are already paid, that the bottomless hole of bank debt has already been filled, that enough is enough. Failing such a declaration, humanity will be consigned to digging a different hole to digging its own grave, as occurred in Flanders a hundred years ago. Thank you very much.